All right, so now let's get into antibiotic resistance. Let's start just by simply defining it. What is resistance? Essentially, it is when the infection no longer responds to antibiotic treatment. When it, or when an infectious agent, which is also known as a pathogen, no longer responds to antibiotic treatment when it normally should. And to give you an example here, here's a little picture of a bacteria. And let's say you cut your finger or something happens and you get a bacteria in there. And what's going to happen? It finds itself in a nice place. So it's going to start to grow and make more bacteria and more bacteria and more bacteria. At some point, you're probably going to have symptoms of this and you're going to go to the doctor. You're going to get an antibiotic, which will go and then target all these bacteria, which then should start to die. And they start to disappear. Eventually you get better and everything's fine. But sometimes what will happen is that you either already have or develop an antibiotic resistant bacteria. That bacteria doesn't care if it has antibiotic or not. Essentially, it ignores it. And what happens then, everybody else is killed off, but this one will start to grow and divide and make more and more, and the infection would come back. So that's the essential uh, concept of what antibiotic resistance is. Are there any questions about that? We're going to go into much more detail, of course. So I'm going to start with giving you a, kind of a scary um, introduction uh, by talking about how serious is this problem. Often we see things in the newspaper, we don't know if they're trying to scare us to sell newspapers or if it's really a problem. And unfortunately, it's really a problem. A couple of quotes from, first from the chief medical officer in the UK, said that modern medicine as we know it, if we don't halt this rise of resistance, will be finished. The WHO, or the World Health Organization, said that without urgent coordinated action, the world is headed for a post-antibiotic era in which common infections and minor injuries which have been treatable for decades, can once again kill. I'll give you a few statistics. This was a report that came out in 2014, and it looked at causes of death now from a number of different uh, causes. For example, here you have cancer with about 8 million deaths per year in the world. Antimicrobial resistance has about 700 deaths per year. And that's compared to diabetes and cholera, et cetera. The prediction was made that if nothing is done, and that's key, if nothing is done, by the year 2050, the number of deaths due to antimicrobial resistance will be 10 million per year. So it will actually exceed the number of cancer deaths. Some people argue a little bit about exactly what this number is, but it is very clear it is a very big number. If we look in different areas, it's different in different parts of the world. For example, in Southeast Asia, it's estimated that 98,000 newborns die each year due to bloodborne infections with resistant bacteria. In the EU, it's estimated there's more than 25,000 deaths per year due to antibiotic resistance, leading also not only to deaths, but a cost of 1.5 billion euros. So it has a huge economic impact as well. Now in Sweden, we are doing well relative to the rest of the world, but we are not going to continue to do well unless something happens. This is looking at data from one particular bacteria and one particular type of resistance 
called ESBL, and you'll hear more about that later. And these are the number of cases between the year 2000 and 2015 in Sweden. And you can see that the numbers are fairly low. In 2015, it was 2,500 cases. But looking at this curve, what you can clearly see is increasing rapidly. What's even more scary is that in 2015, there were 43 cases of something called ESBL carba, which means that it is resistant to yet another antibiotic. And that antibiotic is one that is considered a last resort antibiotic. So things are relatively good in Sweden, but things are not going to stay that way over time. So the impact of not having antibiotics are not only dealing with actual infections, for example, urinary tract infections, gonorrhea, pneumonia, wound infections, blood infections. But antibiotics are also commonly prescribed for a number of different procedures or other conditions. For example, for preterm babies, hip replacements, complicated uh, deliveries, pregnancies, organ transplants, and cancer treatment. So with the, no antibiotics, all of these groups would be affected. So I have a little question for you all to consider for a moment and maybe discuss with your neighbor. Based on what you know, how do you think antibiotic resistance has become such a problem? Can you think of any factor that played into that? So take 30 seconds and talk to your neighbor and see if you know anything about this. I picked out three that were my top list, but you could argue that something else should be added to my list. And we'll talk about many of these things during the course. So overuse of antibiotics, which several of you mentioned in many different ways. One thing that you didn't mention is how clever bacteria are in evolving resistance. Now, as a microbiologist, I'm a little biased because I think bacteria are very clever, but it's absolutely true that bacteria figure out how to uh, become resistant. And then, as you said, the lack of new antibiotic drug development is absolutely uh, a huge impact here. And overuse, I should mention, is in all of these things, in patients, in animals, etc. I don't mean clever in the sense of human cleverness. I mean in they uh, have a uh, mechanisms to evolve resistance, basically. Yeah, I should put quotes around the cleverness. Yeah. Good. So the good news, though, that now they've given me all these really depressing statistics. Researchers worldwide are shifting focus to this problem, all right? I'm one of them. I did not work on antibiotic resistance until um, a few years ago. Secondly, efforts are being made to change policies with regard to overuse. And we'll talk a lot later in the course about how you can get governments and things like that to change these policies, how we're informing doctors, etc. And obviously, much more needs to be done than just these two. And one of the reasons why I'm doing this course is to increase knowledge to everyone about the problem of antibiotic resistance and help with this problem. And that's part of the uh, function of care of this organization. Now, one thing that I did is I referred to antimicrobial resistance sometimes and antibacterial resistance sometimes. Oops. Okay. Uh, Antimicrobial resistance is a more general term. It includes resistance of bacteria, resistance of viruses, resistance of parasites, and resistance of fungi. So these are a much broader set of organisms, all microorganisms, but not all are bacteria. 
whereas antibiotic resistance refers to bacteria specifically. And here are a few examples of bacteria that show resistance, uh, widespread resistance to antibiotics now. This course is going to focus on antibiotic resistance in the bacteria, simply because it, it would have to be three courses if we had all the parts in there. So the questions I'm going to try to tell you about over the next, uh, today and next week, I want to try to talk to you, tell you about what are bacteria, what are antibiotics, how do antibiotics treat infections, where do we find antibiotics, what is resistance, how does it occur, and how is it spread. So that's my outline of my four talks in this course. Are there any questions? So I'm going to start at the basic level here. What are bacteria? Well, bacteria are microorganisms, meaning that you can't see them without a microscope, made up of single cells almost always. And this shows a picture of bacteria on the head of a pin, looking at increasing magnification. So here you can see the individual bacteria, but obviously they're very, very small here. Bacteria refer to a very, very diverse set of species. So when I'm talking about bacteria, I have to talk in generalities and say most bacteria are like that or most are like that because there's estimated to be at the low end 40,000 different species and at the higher estimate 1 billion different species of bacteria. These are two examples here. These aren't really purple, they added that in the picture. Uh, but there's a wide variety of bacteria. This shows an evolutionary tree and I know you can't see the details of this but this shows all the organisms on Earth, all the different um, classes of organisms. If we zoom in, that part of the tree includes all animals, plants, worms, and insects. All the rest are microorganisms. And in particular, if you can see the blue color here, those are the bacteria. So if you look at the diversity on Earth as we know it right now, bacteria make up the vast um, amount of diversity. And again, that's why I'm going to talk about generality so much. Bacteria come in lots of different sh uh, shapes. They, a couple that I want to point out, uh, bacteria that are round like this are known as cocci. And they can be alone like this or you can have two that are kind of stuck together. And some species almost always look stuck together. And those are called diplococci. Then you have streptococci, where you have a chain of these round bacteria going along. Probably the most common are bacilli here, which are typically rod shaped, so they're longer than they are wide. And again, you can get them by themselves, or typically in pairs, diplobacilli or streptobacilli in the long chain. These two classes, the cocci and the bacilli, are the most common. And then you got funny looking ones, let's put it that way. Uh, you have vibrio, which look like a comma shape, so they're rounded like that. Then you have, if we look down here, you have uh, some bacteria actually have an appendage on them known as a stalk. So they have this big stalk attached to them. Others look like a corkscrew shown here. Uh, and then you have helical ones. You have a lot of different combinations. So one of the ways that we categorize bacteria is to look at them. What do they look like? Are they round? Are they long? Are they corkscrew, etc.? So that's one of the classic ways to determine what kind of bacteria you're actually looking at. 
I want to very carefully emphasize this. Bacteria are not viruses. All right, viruses are uh, organisms that grow inside cells. Some people argue that they shouldn't even be called organisms, but viruses cannot grow by themselves. They have to infect another cell and then amplify themselves, and then they can go out and infect another cell. They're not cells, they don't have all the machinery to grow and reproduce. And in fact, you'll hear at the end of my section that some viruses actually infect bacteria. So there are viruses that are specific for bacteria. That is, um, that is not decided. That is, some people uh, debate the viruses should be called alive. Other people say that they should not. But the problem is, it's a problem of semantics. Because if you list the, um, the typical uh, characteristics of a living organism, viruses have some. For example, they can evolve and mutate, but they cannot survive by themselves. They can't replicate by themselves. So there are, it, it becomes tricky. I avoid the question most of the time, basically. Um, but you can actually find papers arguing on both sides. Any other questions about this? So this is why what you might have heard, and I hope you've heard in Metro and uh, on the news, etc., that you never need antibiotics for a cold. Colds are caused by viruses, and the antibiotics target bacteria. So there's no use to take an antibiotic if you have a viral infection. So I just want to point that out strongly. The other thing I want to, again, as a microbiologist, I like bacteria. Uh, there are good bacteria. Most bacteria wish us no harm whatsoever. They live in perfect, peaceful harmony with us. Uh, usually we talk about the bacteria that cause disease, which are called pathogenic bacteria. But most are not causing any trouble at all. In fact, without bacteria, plants would not be able to grow, and we couldn't properly digest our food. So most bacteria are good, nice bacteria that don't bother us. So less than 1% of the bacterial species are pathogens causing disease, and it's probably much less than 1%. Some examples, though, because, of course, these are the ones we worry about, and that's the ones we are going to be treating with antibiotics. A few examples are mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes tuberculosis, and then you have salmonella typhimurium, which is, it causes kind of food poisoning, most often associated with chicken and eggs, and listeria, which is also a type of food poisoning most common in some kinds of uh, processed foods or uh, cheeses, for example, that aren't pasteurized. So those are some examples of the bad bacteria. So in the next section, what I'm gonna to start to do is describe the basic structure of bacteria. So I, first I'll ask if there's any questions about what I've said so far. And then I'm going to ask you a question. Again, you can talk to your neighbor. Can you think of any features a bacterial cell must have to survive and grow? Good. So these are the things I'm going to be talking about in this the rest of this class. So I'm going to start. Here's my little drawing of a typical bacteria. Again, there are many bacteria, and uh, I'm not a very good drawer, so it's the best I could do for a bacteria. And I'm going to go through the different parts of the bacteria first and talk about the different features of bacteria. So the first thing I want to talk quite a bit about is the membrane. 
And the membrane is, as you said, the cell wall or what protects it from the outside. There's actually a difference between the membrane and cell wall that I'll get to. And this is the membrane also called the cytoplasmic membrane. And I'm going to explain to you a little bit what a membrane is. So the major part of a membrane in all cells, in our cells, in plant cells, in all cells, is what is called a phospholipid bilayer. And this acts as a barrier between the environment and the inside of the cells, inside the cell. And this is a picture of what, or a drawing of what a phospholipid bilayer looks like. And this has a couple of features. Each of these little units is called a phospholipid, and they have two properties. The head part at the top, the circle, is hydrophilic. Hydrophilic means they like being in water. They like being solubilized. These little tails, though, is the lipid part. So this is the phosphate that's the lipid. The lipid part is hydrophobic. It is like oil is. It doesn't like water, it wants to stay away from water. The way the bilayer works is there's two of these phospholipids, or two layers on each side. So that on the outside, facing the outside, is uh, the water-loving phosphate part, and on the inside part is again the water-loving phosphate part of the molecule. And in the center is this hydrophobic area. What this does is creates a envelope for the bacteria that makes it very uh, relatively impermeable to things going through it. It's what gives it its um, identity, so to speak, uh, because it separates it from the outside world. This membrane keeps molecules from leaving the cell or entering the cell. All right, and it goes, I, uh, yeah, I should say, it obviously goes all around the cell. This is just one piece of the membrane. This creates a problem for the cell, though. Can you think of what that might be? Can you think of any problem if it's completely covered with this envelope that doesn't allow materials to go in and out? Is there a problem? It needs an orifice, exactly. It needs food going in. It needs waste going out. And the way I've described this, there's no way for food to enter the cell. So what there are, though, is I've simplified it. There are proteins that are embedded in this phospholipid layer. So that some of these proteins go all the way through the phospholipid layer, by layer, and they allow molecules to be transported through the membrane into the cell. So what the bacteria want to do, of course, is to pick up food from the outside and my there? Yeah. Food from the outside and transport it into the cell. And of course any waste products would get pumped out of the cell. So these membrane parts are a huge part of this phospholipid membrane. The proteins also are very specific. It's not like a big hole where they just let anything in or else it would defeat the purpose of having the envelope there, but rather they specifically let things in and out. Any questions about that before I go to the next section? Okay, so the next thing is the membrane I've described there's also something called a cell wall. And in bacteria, there are two kinds of cell walls. And the reason why we know this is something called the Gram stain. And the Gram stain is a very famous old method from, I don't even remember when it was discovered, the 40s or so, which is a technique that uses two different dyes, one that will end up being purple and one that is pink. And what happens is these purple bacteria are ones that keep the purple stain or purple dye inside themselves. 
as well as the pink, but you don't really see the pink because they're so purple. And then you have some bacteria that the purple washes right away when you do this gram stain. And they stain only pink. And we call these gram negative that are pink and gram positive that are, pink, are actually purple. What is shown here is a gram negative rod shaped or bacillus, so you see it's long, whereas the gram positive ones are round, they're cocci. This is a real micrograph, and this is what it looks like. What you can do, which is really fun, it, well, for me, uh, uh, you will get a link to this website where you can actually do a gram stain on the, on the computer, uh, not in real life, and go through the steps to see how it looks. And there's also an animation that I'll link to as well, so you can see what they actually look like. But this is something we do in the lab. So one of the first steps of trying to identify a bacteria is we look at them. Are they gram positive? Are they gram negative? And what shape are they? Those are very defining characteristics. So why is this? Why are there some pink and some purple? Well, the gram positive bacteria have this kind of structure. Okay, so down here, down here on the inside of the cell, you have the membrane layer, and I took away the proteins because it got too messy. And you have this lipid bilayer, and then on top of that you have something that's called peptidoglycan. And peptidoglycan is a very stiff um, molecule which covers the outside of the cell. And it's actually responsible for the bacterial shape so if the peptidoglycan is messed up, it will lose its shape. Gram-positive bacteria have many, many, many layers of this peptidoglycan all around the cell. And what happens with, when you stain these bacteria, the purple dye gets stuck in this peptidoglycan layer. And that's why they look purple. On the other hand, gram-negative bacteria have a completely different structure, a very different structure. Here's the inside of the cell. They have a membrane, just like the gram-positives. And then they have peptidoglycan, but they only have a very thin layer of peptidoglycan. It's still very important for the shape of the cell, but it's only a thin layer. But what they also have is a second membrane. So we call this one the outer membrane and the other membrane, the inner membrane or cytoplasmic. So in this one, the purple dye can escape, basically. It doesn't get stuck in all that peptidoglycan. And so these bacteria look pink instead of purple. Here's some examples of gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria that you may have heard of, gram-positive bacteria MRSA has been very popular in the news, uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Gram-negatives are E. coli or Salmonella, for example. Of course, there are many. So I have one more thought question for you, and then we can have some fika. Uh, some antibiotics target only gram-negative and some only gram-positive bacteria. Can you think of why that might be? What can explain that? So one of the answers is because the shape of the, or the structure of the cell wall and membrane are so different between the two. In particular, gram negatives are very resistant to many antibiotics because it can't get through this outer membrane. There's more features of this outer membrane that I'll come to later, but that's one of the reasons why they can't get in. Can you think of anything else? There are some antibiotics that target the cell wall, and because they're different in their structure, some of the enzymes are different between the gram-positives and the gram-negatives. Good. Yeah. So gram-positives and gram-negatives are 
different. I mean, they're evolutionarily quite diverse. And so some of them have a different proteins in the membranes that can take up or not take up the antibiotic. So the way I wrote it was at first, the physical properties of the cell wall make it easier or more difficult for a given antibiotic to enter the cell. And second, as we'll hear later, some antibiotics target enzymes are different in gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. <laughs> 